Okay, now it's setting it up again. Maybe I should just forget the title. It seems like it gives me trouble. Wait, here we go. It just opened Facebook Live again. Um, is it going live? I don't see it yet. Seriously, what is with this thing? It just randomly opens Facebook. And... You're live. We're live? Yeah, you're live now. All right, so, inshallah, Brother James, like we discussed, please do keep an eye on the, um, the Facebook comments. All right, Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salamu ala rasulullah, wa ala alihi, wa sahbihi, wa nawala. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, everybody. Wa alaykum as-salamu alaykum. Thank you all for joining us for our usual Wednesday uh, discussion. Uh, for, so for the past few weeks, we've been going over a book um, from Dr. Lal Phillips titled The Evolution of Fiqh. And through this book, we are going to together just learn the history of fiqh, how it came to be, and kind of how the uh, madahid, the schools of thought, also came to be in order for us to have an understanding of these schools of thoughts and these differences of opinion and know that these schools of thoughts are no reason for us to cause um, division amongst the ummah as, as a whole. So last week we spoke about, we finished section one, which was titled Foundation, and Brother Clemente, since I know you're prepared, uh, you have your notes, can you give us a quick, a real quick uh, review of what we spoke about last week? Uh, we spoke about Islamic law um, in, in reference to Sharia. And um, it was a, a early period, um, during the early period of Islamic well, law, um, during Islam, um, Sharia, which were revealed and recorded in the Quran and Sunnah. And this related to the foundation of the Imam, I guess you can say that. And um, it was necessary because um, um, I guess because when the Muslims Muslims were being uh, fled from Mecca to Medina, I believe, and the uh, basis of legislation in the Quran was that the human, it was based on reformation, um, based on human customs, customs and practices. So. The chronic legislation. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So I hope yeah, I'm not good. I hope I'm. Yeah, the, in terms of the legal content of the, the Quran, you're right. The Sharia was based on uh, have four main principles. Yeah, so one. Uh, yeah, this, I'm going. Okay, tell I'm going to just, So just tell me one of the four main oh. principles, real quick. Okay, one of the four. Okay. Uh, if you remember. And it's uh, I got it. Um, um, it remove, uh, reduction of religious obligation, removal. It makes it. Removal of difficulty. Right. So very, very good. The first one mentioned was the Sharia is meant to remove uh, the difficulty, uh, remove difficulty for the human being. It's not meant to cause harm or be a burden, but instead make it clear to the human being on how we live and make it in order to make life easier for the human being. So yes, that's number one. Can someone tell me another? Uh, one of the four main principles. There's four. You mentioned one, which is the removal of of, uh, of difficulty for for man. What's another main principle of the the Sharia? Uh, anyone remember? Should I pick? Should I pick up? Should I pick on somebody? Okay. All right. No problem. We'll go ahead and uh, just mention them off, uh, order them off real quick. So we mentioned the first one was removal of difficulty. Second one, uh, brother uh, Clemente mentioned, was the reduction of religious obligation. Um, the third one, the promotion of uh, human welfare. It's meant to be um, of benefit to to mankind. And the fourth one was universal justice. The Sharia does not discriminate based off of class or ethnicity. It's meant to, to provide a universal justice for all of 
mankind. And so these were the four main principles of the Sharia that we, we didn't discuss last week. And this we were going into the second stage, which is the establishment. And during this stage, uh, Dr. Bilal Phillips focuses on the period of the, uh, the Rashidin, the four righteous uh, caliphs. So real quickly, who here can tell me who are the four righteous caliphs, the first four um, Khalifa in, is in Islamic history? James, you want to take a crack at it? Tell me at least one of the four. Abu Bakr. The, the four of the rightly guided caliphs. Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, yes, was the, the first was the first caliph after the Prophet. Who was who was the second? Umar. Yeah, Umar bin al-Khattab, yes, very good. And who was uh, the third? Uthman. Yep, Umar Uthman ibn Affan, absolutely. And the, 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 the fourth. Ali. Yes, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Absolutely. Perfect. Ahsan, perfect, perfect. So these were the four, the very first, uh, very first four um, caliphs during um, the is, uh, Islamic, during Islamic history, and they're very often referred to as the, the Rashidi, the rightly guided caliphs. And Throughout this very short chapter, this chapter is only about, I think, eight to, uh, to nine pages, so it's not that long, but we are introduced to a variety of different terms that are found in, in fiqh. And while this chapter is short, it's very important because it highlights for us what the practice was of the companions um, once the Prophet peace and blessings be upon him, passed away and what their process was in determining particular rulings based off their, their knowledge. And so during this time, Dr. Bilal mentions that the Islamic State expanded uh, greatly. Um, it, 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 the, the Muslims and the leaders, Islamic leaders were heavily expanding their territory to uh, Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, these areas that a lot of the companions weren't familiar with. And so when Islam was introduced to these areas and there, were, and there was a lot of interactions going on between the um, early Muslims and, these, and the new Muslims of these different regions, of course, these different regions had certain practices and cultural norms that the early Muslims were not very familiar with. And so in the book, it men uh, he mentions that due to these new um, practices and norms that they were not familiar with, the companions and the, uh, and the, and the Khalifa, the, the caliphs, they ran into a challenge of not really finding these particular practices mentioned in, in the Quran or mentioned from the Prophet and so peace and blessings be upon him. So from this, the companions and the, uh, especially specifically the, the caliphs, they developed a certain procedure in how to derive certain rulings based off these new um, circumstances. And inshallah ta'ala will go over um, all five. The first he mentioned is whenever they were pressed with the particular situation, they would refer to force first the Quran. After that, if they could not find that particular issue that they ran into in the Quran, they would then go to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And again, remind me what do we what is the what do we mean when we say, when we say Sunnah, uh, Brother Clemente? Um, Sona is the, is the, um, what well, Hadith is the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings. So the Sona is the, his action. The Sunnah the act, actions and sayings. Actions. Okay. Action, actions and sayings. Okay. Yes. Correct. Basically Sunnah means like, you know, his way, his, his path. Okay. Sunnah refers to the actions and sayings of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
who of course was in a way the representative of the, the Quran. He would he walked and talked to the Quran. So he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we talked about this last week. He would serve as a clarification for the Quran about some more specific issues. Like you mentioned about wudu, for example, we're told to make wudu in the Quran, but we're not really told how. We learned that from the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Same with Salah, prayer. We're told to pray in the Quran, but we're not told specifically how to pray. We learned that through the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, they would first look in the Quran, then they would look to the Sunnah. And if they would not, if they were not able to find a reference in the Sunnah or the Quran in regards to the specific, specific situation that they were trying to address, they would then call a Shura. So what is, what is Shura? Can someone here tell me the definition of, of Shura? A uh, shura is a gathering of the Islamic community together to um, come up with a ruling. Right, somewhat. So shura yeah, is basically something like that. It's a consultation, a, a gathering of individuals um, in order to consult uh, who serve as a kind of a consultative committee, right? And we, and we hear this term many, many times in, uh, in our communities, you know, shura. And so the caliph would call this shura, who of course during the time of the uh, Rashidin, the four rightly guided caliphs, it was some of the very most prominent uh, sahaba, the companions of that time who would make up this shura. And so they would try and reach a ijma, ijma, which basically means a consensus. They would try and reach a consensus from amongst the shura into what is the proper ruling based on this particular problem or specific problem that they were uh, trying to address. So ijma, try to remember that whether that's another uh, important term for us to remember, is derived from the term jama, which a lot of us I know are very familiar with, which basically jama we all know means like congregation, like a gathering. So ijma basically means, you know, a uh, consensus, you know, a majority uh, consensus from a, from a group of people. So they would try to reach to an uh, ijma. If they were not able to reach an ijma, then the um, the caliph would do his own ijtihad. Now, this term we went over um, both last week and the week before ijtihad. Can someone here tell me the definition of of ijtihad. Besides Brother Hasib, because I know Brother Hasib is an expert at it. So we're not going to let him make it easy for us. Ijtihad. Who here remembers the term and knows the definition of the term ijtihad? Uh, does it refer to the scholars? The scholars yeah. practice ijtihad. So they, that's, is that when you, you have to, you get together uh, the hadith and opinions of the Sahaba? No. Okay. All right, sister, let's see, who am I gonna pick on? Uh, sister Farhana and sister Hunas, Huda, and uh, sister Adina, since you're a, since you're a three person army, I'm sure you guys can come together and, and tell me the definition of ijtihad. It's, so it's basically a decision made based on the consultation of the different companions or um, and the Prophet Sallallahu or now the scholars. Right. Ijtihad, like you mentioned, it's a decision, a reasoned, um, decision that someone make that makes based off the their understanding of the Quran and the the Sunnah and this can be done like you mentioned either um, from a group or it can be done individually and we spoke about this term a couple times uh, uh, for the past couple weeks and we also mentioned and this is another important opportunity for me to again mention that when we say ijtihad, this, you know, making an independent decision 
based off what one knows since you can't find a specific ruling in the Quran or the Sunnah. We mentioned that this is not something that just anyone can do. In order for someone to be able to do this particular type of action, they of course need to be learned, they need to be trained, they need to be qualified in order to make these type of decisions. This is very important to mention because you'll find a lot of Muslims who will take the term ijtihad and misrepresent it and misdefine it as meaning that anyone can just make any decision, uh, any independent decision they want, make their own interpretation on anything uh, that, that they want. As a matter of fact, I remember a couple of years ago, there was a, a video that I watched about this uh, Muslim woman uh, and she basically was advocating for ijtihad. Basically, everyone interpreting the Quran and the Hadith any way that they want and is always up to the particular individual. She was heavily advocating um, for this. And this is very, very dangerous, this type of thinking. And can someone here give me some examples of how, why would that be dangerous? Why would it be dangerous to say that is anyone can practice ijtihad? What are some dangers that come out with that mindset? Because if everyone relies on their perspective of what they feel or what they think based on lack of information and lack of knowledge, then you will have a numerous of people who one might agree with the individual, or you might have, you develop cliques or different sex or different, I guess different sex can come out of this. So if someone says this ruling, I believe it's this, and, and two or three might agree, then you might, have, you might have different cliques or misinformation, I guess. No, very, very excellent example, Brother Clemente. Basically, you know, if one of the dangers is everyone could just start coming up with their own ideas of, of religion, then you create all these different factions, right? So very, very, very good example. Who here can provide me another example of some dangers of misunderstanding entity had and misusing it? Um, to me, what, what the, we mentioned, like the, the, the female that I mentioned before was trying to use it as. So uh, one of the examples can be, I think a few years ago and every few years, there is like uh, some, uh, <clears throat> some claiming to be knowledgeable, a Muslim, you know, a lady will come up and they, she will try to lead the prayers, you know, claiming that this, this is uh, permissible and it's not, you know, but that's their own interpretation of Quran and Sunnah, right? So, so these are some of the dangers which can, can happen all the time. Right, absolutely, absolutely. So someone could just completely change um, very established rulings in the religion that we know to to be true, based off the fact that they don't have any any knowledge themselves. And that's so that can, like Brother Shahid mentioned, cause a lot of misunderstandings and mis um, yeah, basically, so a lot of misunderstandings and misrepresentations of the religion cause a lot of confusion. So we can see there's a lot of danger in misunderstanding this, this term. And we mentioned this, and we mentioned this hadith once, I'll mention it again. The Prophet Wasallam said that in, when it comes to people practicing ijtihad or you know, people making judge, judgment calls, you know, one of them is entered into the Jannah, two of these of them are entered into hellfire. The one in one turn fire. When, when, when the one entered into Jannah is one who practices it with, with knowledge and does it with, uh, with justice. The one that, the two that enter the hellfire is one that does it with knowledge, but then against justice. So basically they have knowledge, but they make, they deliberately make an incorrect ruling for, based off their own uh, desires. And number two is one that judges without knowledge. So Again, if you're making judgment calls and you don't have knowledge, not only are, are you causing uh, harm to the community, but you're also causing harm for, for yourself. So it's very important for us to understand that had is not a practice that just anyone can do. Just like with medicine, with law, with engineering, you need to have someone who is qualified and trained in order to do that practice, right?
So we also have a Facebook comment saying it can lead to disbelief as well. Right. Absolutely. It can it can lead to dis dis disbelief because if you say something that's very, let's say something that goes against a core principle um, in, in Islam, let's say for the example, you know, grave worship, or let's say for example, you know, wearing charms and, and things, things of that nature, that those particular acts are a form of a form of disbelief. And so mispracticing it she had to make to give people those wrong understandings could even lead to something as severe as, as disbelief. So very, very excellent um, uh, addition. Are there any other comments, uh, Brother James? No, not so far, just that one. Okay, good. And for those of you who are watching through Facebook, just a quick reminder that the Zoom and the Facebook, there's gonna be a 20 second delay. So if it takes us a little bit of time to get to your comment, please do uh, be patient with us. But are there any questions regarding HD hat before we uh, move on? All right, khair, inshallah. So from here we start, he starts to talk about the general um, practice of the Sahaba when they would indeed practice ijtihad, when they would make their own individual uh, rulings based off what, what they knew. He mentioned here, and just one big thing I think we can get from what we're about to mention is this kind of, sh kind of shows us how, and how really the, how humble the companions were. They were not, they were very, they wanted to be very, very careful when it came to making wounds. So was number one he mentioned is that they would make it clear to the person they were speaking to, this was based off their own understanding. It was not necessarily from Allah himself. And they would, he mentions uh, a quotation from Ibn Mas'ud. You know, he would say, he would, he would typically say, you know, if it is correct, then it's from Allah, but if it is incorrect, then it is from me and the shaitan. So they would make it very clear to the person that don't take, you know, my ruling and just treat it as if it is ab absolute. This is based off my understanding. Follow it, but it may, it, it's not exactly, it's not from Allah. So don't take it as an, abs an absolute, absolute truth. So the Sahaba, they were very careful when they would make um, particular wounds. They wanted to make it very clear that this is based off their own understanding and they are not um, saying that this is from, this is from, from Allah. So that's number one. Um, secondly, they are also very humble in their ruling. So for example, if they made a ruling but then hadith that it was authentic, for example, was mentioned to them at a later time, which contradicted their previous rulings, their previous ruling, they would automatically step back and say, okay, well then I, res I rescind my, what, what I said earlier based off this particular, particular amount of knowledge. Very similar to how, how we mentioned last week, I remember the Prophet he would, make a particular ruling based on what was currently revealed to him. But then if when the law subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal something else to show him the proper way, he salam and salam, peace be upon him, would go with that ruling based off what Allah revealed to him. So, and this is the practice that the companions also would uphold when they would make a particular uh, ruling, but then they found a hadith which showed them otherwise. So they were very, very humble and very, very, very careful. Um, number three is that the Sahaba, and this is very, very key, they would respect for the most part each other's opinions. So for example, if there was a companion that had a different um, opinion about a particular issue than another companion, they would have respect for one another. They would not allow these differences of opinion to cause major divisions between them. They would try their best to be 
humble and understand that, you know, when it comes to these specific issues that are not generally um, highlighted in the Quran or the Sunnah, having that difference of opinion is, is okay. And so it's important, it's important for us to understand uh, these, these practices because we find many times in our own communities, you know, Muslims making completely different factions and misogyny in communities based off very minor, minor things. And I'm sure quite a few of us can even give some examples of um, these divisions being caused by very, very minor, minor issues. And so the companions would do their best to really try and avoid causing serious divisions between the ummah based off these differences of, of opinion. And so from here, the last part, he just, he's talk, speaking about the different characteristics of fiqh that's derived from this period. We've already discussed um, a few of them. We mentioned a couple, a couple terms, such as shura, ijma'a, ijtihad, uh, their meanings. And from here, he just starts to speak about a little bit some of the char other characteristics that um, we derived from, from this time. He mentions the, the, the term al fiqh al waqi'i, which basically means like realistic fiqh. They, the companions, would drive rulings based off very practical situations that are actually happening, not hypothetical. And this is mentioned because there are also, we have issues in our ummah where people will ask hypothetical questions based off of a situation that's probably not really going to, to happen, making things needlessly difficult. For example, I believe, I think I heard of some really crazy outlandish question that someone asked, like, um, asked a sheikh, like, um, this is going to be a little crazy. I think it was something in regards to if someone, I think it was like if someone, someone actually asked this to a sheikh, like, if someone had, you know, fornicated with a fish in the water, would the water be considered, um, I know it's, it's ridiculous, but this was an actual, would the water be, cons, would the water be considered nad, najis, would it be considered impure, or would we be able to make we'll do it with that water? And it's like, why are you even asking such a ridiculous question, you know? Nothing like that is probably ever going to happen. So why even bother asking that question unless you're actually running into that particular issue? So it gets, goes into how people will overcomplicate the religion, right? And we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago as, as well, that for the most part, when it comes to the Sharia, it's mainly general principles and guidelines. Not everything, you know, it's specific in certain, in certain issues, of course, as when it needs to be. But for the most part, the Sharia is general principles and guidelines in order not to make things too difficult on the believers. But we're human beings, sometimes we can overcomplicate things. And so when the Sahaba would, would practice fiqh, it would be on a practical level. They wouldn't come up with all these different hypothetical um, situations and then make rulings based on a situation that probably never were gonna happen, like you know, fornicating with a fish, for, for example. Um, another characteristic is, you know, where we learn about um, the respect of having difference of differences of, 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 of opinions. You know, we, meant, we mentioned, we mentioned that, that, that already. And really the last thing he mentions and this, I think, I wouldn't use the word methab, but he basically mentions in the last part that there's really only one methab, one practice. There were all these different uh, schools of and factions, you know, due to the fact that, of course, the companions were all close by and, and together. 
and that they had um, respect for the small differences of opinions and for the most part, when it came to the larger ones, it was left to the practice of the, um, the Khalifa. So, and that's really the main points I wanted to highlight in this particular chapter. So like I mentioned, this chapter was very, very short, only like about seven to, to eight pages at, at that. So before I go into some questions I wanna ask the audience, I wanna first and foremost ask those who may have also read the chapter, if there are any other um, points that you wanted to mention or, some, or things that you got out of the chapter that you wanted to share with everyone, everyone here. Brother Clemente, how about you? You read the chapter a couple times, right? Right. I, I just had something. I want. I had a I really had a question because I, I was thinking about. I think I'm saying it, when they say my my. Am I saying it right? My have my methab. Methab. So methab, and you weren't here with us when we described that term. So I don't. I won't. I won't blame you for not remembering. But methab essentially means like a a school of thought. From an Islamic right. concept, it means a, like a school of thought. Like Maliki, Hanafi. Yes, like, yeah, Hanafi, Maliki, Hanbali, and Shafi. Those are the four, the four main schools, the schools of thought, and also known as the four Medheb. Medheb in Arabic literally translates to like road or way or path. From an Islamic term, Medheb means like just a, a school of thought, a practice. So uh, with the different practices, it mentioned it was one. Do we know which one it was? There was really, there was no medheb. Okay. There, there, that was not really even a, a term at that point. His, his, his point is that there was only one particular way. So from the actual, from, my, from, from what I understand, um, the term medheb wasn't really adopted yet at that time. But in the terms of practicality, there was only one particular medheb or school of thought, so, so to speak. And it didn't, it didn't, it didn't really have, have a name. Okay. I think his main point there was there really was not very many, there was little to no religious factions during the time of the, the Rashidin at, at that time. There were political factions later on, but that's a whole other um, uh, discussion. I, one, one thing I did want to bring out was I remember reading something about the infrequent, like the quotation of Hadith, like during that time, even though we relied on the Hadith, it wasn't as much, uh, we didn't, they didn't really quote as much from it, mostly the Quran, and then they did use the Hadith, but it wasn't, they didn't allow too mis misquoting it, I guess. But here's talking about Omar, Omar bin al-Khattab, which um, we won't go into too much detail, but essentially I think he uh, forbade the writing of, of the Hadith, because the Arabs, they had a very, they had an oral tradition of recording, of recording, recording things, and during the time of Thomas al -Sallam, instead of writing things down, it was mostly everything was done orally, and so, and he, he mentions in the book that it was heavily discouraged to over quote a hadith just because the, the companions were really afraid of misquoting the Prophet They didn't want to say anything that could potentially be, be wrong. So again, just kind of highlighting that the companions were very, very careful with making rulings and quoting a hadith. Um, today, I mean, and I, I saw, I think. I was about to mention that. I was about to say today. How today, to every, that. everyone quotes, quotes a hadith out of context all the time in order to kind of get, get their, their point across. But it's just a reminder for us that we should also do our best to try and be careful in quoting a hadith without understanding the context of it or without fully understanding the whole hadith in, the, in and of itself. And I'm laughing because I did. They remember, remember I got upset. <laughs> you really want me to break that? <laughs> you can't. No, you can't now because it's funny looking back. But I was serious, man. That's the... <laughs> you really want to bring it up? You can because I didn't get the. I had to get the right context. Right. If I didn't get the right context, I had to talk to you about it. Like serious. You had. To, you could reach it. I had to talk, you had to talk me off the ledge. <laughs> All right. Well, since Clemente's opening. Exposing himself and exposing. I just himself. had to, man, because it, 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 I was serious at the time, man. I was serious. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you. I'll let, I'll let you say it, man. Go ahead. Man, it was a hadith about raising head, talking about. Uh, I get when my thing was people of color. It was like raising head. I was like, huh? I like that's some racist stuff. Anyway, like, um, I kind of went 
to Memento's referring to the hadith, um, and this hadith actually is mentioned in the book here, uh, in which the Prophet Sallallahu essentially he said, I'm not quoting, I'm not quoting word for word, but just over essentially, um, my favorite word is just Nahela knows, um, essentially, um, he said that even if your leader was, quote, you know, a raisin head, kind of referring to, you know, a heavily, a very, very dark Abyssinian, it's like slave was your leader, you need to follow that, uh, that, that person. And the, and the context, of course, was at that time, the Arabs looked down upon um, Abyssinians, people of color. This, this is a fact, and I don't, I don't think anyone can, can deny that. Of course, Islam, Islam completely destroyed the concept of racism. There was also something very clear that you know, no Arab is, is, is above a non-Arab or a black person is above a white person except in terms of piety. And of course, Allah SWT says in the Quran that we have not, we have made you in different tribes and nations in order for you to know one another. So it's made very, very clear. But of course, at that time, those who were, one, most of those, a lot, many who were of color were, were, were slaves and were seen as less than, 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 than the Arabs. And so the Prophet ﷺ was just kind of, even if your person was in this particular status that many at the time saw as lower, if that person was appointed your leader, you follow that person. So if anything, that hadith was lifting up, you know, people of color. But, you know, without having that understanding, that context, that's why people like you know, Brother Clemente kind of got upset when you, when you first, um, first saw that. So, Kenneth, I had um, two points that I found to be kind of um, I wanted to share. Please. Um, one point that I found important was where it says that although the Sahaba debated and differed on various points of law, their differences rarely reached the level of disunity and factionalism, mm -hmm. which characterized later periods. And I found that to be really important because yes, usually when it comes to rulings, that's where we as Muslims start arguing. So they were so humble and so willing to hear each other's opinions that they wouldn't lead themselves to the point of arguing with each other. So I found that to be really important. And also the concept of shura, that's a concept that's really important too because it helps, it, there's a lot of blessings or baraka in shura. And it also, um, one of the blessings that helps the leader to make decisions. And it also almost plays a role of a safety net because the whole group is kind of making the decision in a way so it doesn't fall on the head of the leader alone. He's actually done consultation. So that's, I believe is really important, you know, the shura concept. And even I feel within families, family members should develop a shura system within their homes where parents are doing shura with their children because it's a really good practice to have. <clears throat> no, absolutely, and it makes the children feel like you know they're involved in the decision. It, it's a it's a great way to uh, reach compromise and really empower and, and empower others in your families. I think, I think that's a very good point, Sister Farhana. And yeah, like you mentioned, and like and like we we mentioned today that the companions were very respectful and were very very aware of not wanting to cause unnecessary divisions. And they were not they were not power hungry they were willing to accept if a mistake was made. So that's really important. Right, and I think it's very important for us to understand as well, because I think a lot of us, myself, I've, I've unfortunately uh, had many different uh, religious debates over very, when I think about it, really just inconsequential things. And it's just a reminder for, for all of us that when you're talking to a brother or a sister and they happen to, like, say, for example, follow a different method than you, or they just have a different a different opinion than you uh, about about a, about a particular um, issue. Sometimes the best thing to do is just, you know, be be silent and say, I, I, I appreciate your stance, brother. It's not going I appreciate it, and leave leave it at that because it's very important for you know, the Muslim Ummah to be, to be united. When we're united is when we're, when we're strong. The reason why, you know, the Muslim Ummah right now is so weak is because we're all heavily 
divided due to nationalism, racism, sectarianism, all these different things. So very, very excellent point, sister. Sister. So how do you spell shooter? How do you spell that? What she's, um... Well, I mean, English, you can spell it however you want. Um, just uh, sound it out. But the way people typically spell it in English is S-H-U-R-A-H. You can spell it S-H-U-R-A. You can spell it S-O-R-A. It really doesn't matter because it's an Arabic, it's an Arabic word that you get people that you can transliterate into English. So there's really not any um, okay. uh, strict, strict rules in, in that. Any other um, comments in regards to this chapter that people, that people want to share? Like what they got from this chapter? What are some personal lessons we can get from this, from this chapter? Am I going to have to start picking on people? All right. James, I'm going to pick on you. Yeah, Steve, you try to unmute me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but unfortunately, it, it gives you the option. Yeah, just to um, No, it's it's definitely an important lesson to um, remember, and especially when we're talking about, you know, like you said, not to go over. Islam is made easy, you know. People make it difficult, and I think this chapter definitely reflects that, you know making things as simple as possible and not going overboard and not overdoing things that are one meant to be easy like prayer is very set and how to do it it's not complicated and i think some people even make prayer complicated oh yeah absolutely i remember that kind of reminds me i knew this one um person unfortunately he was born muslim but he didn't really identify as muslim anymore and he was like telling me how his father would be so strict with him like you know he had to make sure his hands were right here and not like a centimeter under and if they were he would like beat him and all this stuff like you know just make things unnecessarily um difficult now of course you also want to oversimplify things but it's also important to, that to know that this time is made, meant to be meant to be easy and not so so rigid as sometimes we, we make it a very uh, good point uh, brother james all right who else Sister Nahel, you've been awfully quiet tonight. Should I pick up? All right, uh, Mr. Daniel, how about you? I'm doing loud, my brother. It's uh, it was a great presentation. Um, I do. <laughs> I don't necessarily want to want to add on to it, but it is something to uh, add into the uh, discussion. One of the um, uh, other um, fic debates in regards for um, uh, hypothetical fic was if somebody breaks their wudu uh, inside of a bag and then walks away from it and then comes back and then uh, opens up the bag and smells it, uh, does he then break his wudu then or did he break his wudu when he originally broke his wudu? What? <laughs> What? Because <laughs> there's the uh, hadith that says that um, if you um, if you uh, are inside of prayer, if you feel something, then you have not broken your wudu. But if you smell something, then you're supposed to hold up your nose. Yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah. Go to make wudu. Well, based on that hadith, their argument is, you know, since you have, you know, uh, smelt it, then uh, you then have to go make your wudu afterwards the argument like this hypothetical fic just uh so if you do it in a bag and then if you don't <laughs> smell anything is that what how it is how so it went? do you break your wudu after you smell it or do you break your wudu when you have broken your wudu when you have not smelled it um or do you do it both times like basically these are like you know um um atrocious uh you know just things that d you don't need to ask like you know right and you definitely don't need to uh pass gas in a bag and then try and smell <laughs> <Anyone? Absolutely. laughs> try and do that um but yeah and even in that hadith in and of itself people can take it um 
So for it just, you know, and even that hadith in itself, I don't know if Sheikh Jessica, it just mainly means, you know, you know, sometimes your mind can play tricks on you if, if, if you don't, but like, for example, you know, let's say you did um, pass gas and you like really felt it, but you didn't smell anything. If you know for sure you passed gas and passed gas, so even, don't even take that hadith and be like, well, I didn't smell anything, even though I really felt it, but I didn't smell anything. So I think I'm, I'm good. Even that hadith, sometimes people can take that one too rigidly as, uh, as well. Alhamdulillah. Another good example of needlessly hypothetical uh, questions. <laughs> it's a great example, but a bad example in one, alhamdulillah. Uh, any other um, questions or, or comment, comments in regards to this chapter or, or, or what we've discussed tonight or if there's anything I said no one understood or someone who read the chapter thought I should have mentioned but didn't mention? Any comments in the Facebook Live, James? No, no comments. Okay. All right, so inshallah ta'ala, if there are no other comments or questions, we can go ahead and stop here. So inshallah, next week we'll go over um, section, uh, chapter three or section three of uh, the third stage. So I ask everyone here to please try and read that chapter beforehand so we can have a um, good discussion. I attached the, I posted the PDF in the, uh, WhatsApp. You can also buy it off Amazon, which I definitely encourage everyone here uh, to do if if you can. <clears throat> we meet here every Wednesday, uh, 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. And well, of course, we're also doing every Tuesday as well, same time. And we're also doing our um, Friday reminders. So alhamdulillah, Embrace, we are just trying to stay as active as possible during uh, the shutdown, we're trying to have something almost every day. And just quick, really quick announcements. Um, this Saturday, we're going to be having our very first Pass the Mic program. This program focuses on, focuses on having an open dialogue with the audience and giving the audience an opportunity to contribute to the conversation and share their experiences, thoughts, and ideas. And so the main theme for Saturday is going to be how we can overcome the <clears throat> cultural divisions in our American Muslim community. I know everyone here has had probably many experiences in our community where we're heavily um, sectionalized. Every ethnicity is kind of just hanging out with their own ethnicity. There's not really much mixing. And this has caused a lot of issues for converts like us who don't really have their own place uh, in many of the, in, the, in their misajid. So inshallah, that's gonna be the main topic for the past the mic session. It's gonna be through Zoom. I heavily encourage everyone here to please take part in the conversation and inshallah it should be a fruitful conversation and we can discuss on how we can overcome uh, these challenges in our community. Sunday is going to be a very fun program. It's going to be virtual family game night. Those of you from Dallas know that usually the first weekend of every month we try to do our family fun night. Of course, during since we're in a pandemic and a lockdown, we're not able to do that. So we're doing a virtual a family game that we'll, we'll be playing a game um, online that our brother Inti Sarhak will be hosting. So I ask everyone here to please participate in that program as well. All this information will be posted in our WhatsApp and Facebook group. So please do uh, stay tuned. All right. So I think from there we can go ahead and close. I'll give everyone one more opportunity to ask questions or give give comments. All right, no problem. And just one last quick thing, guys. As you saw, I'm not as nice as Sheikh Jassi. I will definitely call people out if no one uh, says anything. So please do your best to come prepared because inshallah, I really want all of us to try and learn from, from, these, from these sessions, not just come and have a nice talk and then forget. Let's inshallah try and learn um, from, from, from these discussions inshallah. So please do be prepared. Um, next week to, to the best of your ability. Allahumma subhanahu wa bihamdik ashtu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa ilaik. 
جزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته